Good morning. morning. We'll take as our text this morning, Romans chapter 10. We'll start in verse 14. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Let us pray together. We'll take our prayer from Psalm 119. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we've just finished a long series on the Gospel of John. And I want to take a a short break to do something that's outside the norm for us. So rather than go straight into another text, uh, I want to take a couple of weeks to do some topical preaching. Um, just on some real fundamental stuff, uh, basically on the fundamentals of conversion and the fundamentals of the faith, what we sometimes refer to as the five steps, uh, or you know, in times past it, it used to be called the five finger method. It was a mnemonic device, right? You've got one step for each finger. That's awfully convenient, right? <laughs> you hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Right? Any man with a single hand or foot, doesn't matter which, can remember that thing. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I want to take some time to consider you know, those fundamental teachings uh, that, we, uh, that we often give from the Scriptures. Uh, the way that we come to a, a faith in Jesus... Uh, such that we have confidence that we will receive the reward of eternal life. So I've prepared uh, five sermons, one speaking about each step. And I've got a couple of goals with these sermons, uh, because I think for, for most of us here, this is stuff that, you know, we've gone through personally, Right? We've, we've gone through those five steps, culminating in baptism. Um, and we've probably grown up hearing about these five things. Like if you grew up in the church, you probably heard about them you know, at least three times a week. Right? You probably heard about them more times than there were sermons in the week. Um, so it's, it's my hope that these messages will be helpful, of course, to anybody who has not yet entered the faith through baptism, right? So these these can be a resource for you, uh, like if you're speaking with your friends or your neighbors about the faith, about what we believe, how you come to be a faithful disciple of Jesus, right? But I don't want these to be throwaways for anybody who has already entered the faith through baptism. So one of the things that I hope to do with this uh, is to you know, refresh our understanding of what we've been taught and what we believe, uh, and to expand our appreciation for it. Right? Because one of the things that we've seen as we go through Scripture is that all of these things that, uh, that we teach as, as fundamentals of doctrine, um, I would, for example, we've spent a lot of time over the course of John's Gospel considering the Lord's Supper right? and the fullness of its meaning. Uh, we see that the... Uh, the things that God commands have a fullness to them, right? That God uh, binds together a lot of things over the course of His Scriptures. It, it, you can't just boil down 
the faith to a set of... Well, I mean, when we boil it down to like a, a five-finger plan, we are doing a lot of boiling down. right? What we are remembering is the core of a much fuller body that the Lord presents to us in the Scripture. So again, for example, with the Lord's Supper, we've got, we've got the bare bones of the commandment, right? Keep it each Lord's Day. Uh, we have the emblems, we have the bread and the fruit of the vine. We have what they represent, the body and blood of our Lord. We have the way in which we're to take them. Uh, but as we look through the Scriptures, we see that, that the Lord spends a lot of time building up the significance of these emblems so that we should have a rich and full understanding, right? So that we should be able to think of, you know, for example, the Passover sacrifice whenever we partake of the supper. Uh, just, just to give an example. Uh, the same is true of hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Uh, that there is some scriptural fullness to that that I hope to be able to tap into as we consider them over the next couple of weeks. All right, I want us to, as we consider these things, uh, to help us stay firm in the faith. Because one thing that we read throughout the scriptures, we see it all over the place, is that God's people are in constant need of uh, you could call it reconversion, right? In constant need of reminder. We, we see it so often, for example, with Israel. We saw it uh, this morning in our auditorium class that Israel is constantly backsliding, and they are constantly in need of reminder. Right? They had already been told that Aaron was the high priest. They had already been shown that he was accepted, but they needed to be reminded they need to have these things called to mind constantly uh, because there's, there's essentially a war on in each of our hearts. Right? The adversary is constantly trying to chip away at you or at the very least invite you to forget and just not think about, not dwell on the faith that has been delivered to us. And so we constantly need reminders as our hearts and our minds tend to wander. We have to allow the word of the Lord to constantly bring us back to where we need to be. You know, we are like, well, it's you know, no coincidence that the scripture compares us to sheep. Because what do, what do livestock do if you're not tending after them? They just wander around all over the place. Right? You'll go out and you have no idea where anything's at. Things need to be you know, led back, brought back to the fold, and we have to constantly allow the word of the Lord to bring us back to where we need to be, allow the good shepherd to do his work. So this segues us into this morning's topic, which is hearing. This is the power of the word of God. We frequently quote from Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So this speaks to the power of the word of the Lord. Right, Paul speaks to this belief in Jesus Christ and the confession of his name in Romans 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We read up in verse 13. But... How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard, Paul asks in verse 14. All right, and the conclusion in verse 17, so faith comes from hearing. All right, everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but the way that that starts, the way that that faith is arrived at, that confession is arrived at, is through hearing, Paul says, and hearing through the word of Christ. So faith starts with the power of the word of Christ. Now I want us to consider what the scriptures have to say about that. All right, because it does not amount to... like if, if you just ripped this... If I was really self-serving and wanted to just rip this passage straight out of context, I could make this a sermon about how great preachers are and how necessary we are. Right? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? But of course, the scriptural fullness, this is, this is not just like a preacher booster. The scriptural fullness of this, whenever Paul says that hearing comes through the word of Christ, again, he is tapping into something very full and very rich and much bigger than just one preacher up behind the pulpit. 
Because what we learn in Scripture is that God's speech, the Word of Christ, is not only the beginning of faith, but it is the beginning of everything. I want us to consider uh, how th this is framed in other parts of the Scriptures. For example, the Hebrew writer, uh, whenever he starts out his letter, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, Right, he frames the, this whole matter of the gospel, what he is proclaiming to the Hebrews. He frames it in terms of God's speech. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. And yes, yeah, since this is a topical sermon, we're going to do a lot more bouncing around than we normally do. So, we'll give your, give your Bible hands a workout. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago... At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. The Hebrew writer says that the whole history of Israel and the whole history of the church can be framed as a matter of how God spoke to them. God spoke to our fathers. You know, we recognize that's a significant phrase, our fathers. He spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. But more than that, more than pointing to the whole history of Israel and the whole history of the church, He points to all of history, period. Right? He points back to the beginning, uh, he says of the Son that He is appointed the heir of all things through whom also God created the world. Or he takes us all the way back to the very beginning. Because God's speech is not just limited to the nation of Israel or to the church, but it stretches back to the very beginning. All right, we all know how Moses starts the law. All right, we could probably quote the first verse of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we remember how he did that. Right? We continue to read in Genesis 1 that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And this is the first occurrence of something that we see. Uh, this, this is, this is a, an actual figure for you. I counted, and this is the literal number of times that we see it in the Old Testament, a bazillion times in the Old Testament that we read this phrase, and God said, or the Lord said, or thus says the Lord and it starts here in Genesis 1, verse 3. God said, Amar Elohim, let there be light. And in response to his commandment, there was light. We see things functioning the way they ought to. We'll, we'll file this away in the back of our minds. As we've read through the law, we've considered all of the high points in you know, Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. There are all these points where... Uh, where Moses tells us, just as the Lord said, so Israel did. Right? Or just as the Lord said, so Moses did. As he commanded him, so he did. We find that pattern also starting here in Genesis 1, verse 3. The Lord said, let there be light. So there was light. But this is why we ascribe so much to hearing the word of God. This is why we say it is so valuable and so necessary to be in the Word. All right, again, this is not just the rule book. It is. But it's not just the rule book. All right, it is not just the place where we go to, to derive our authority to establish doctrine. It is... I mean, it's the Word of God. And everything... Everything has its existence through the Word of God. Have you ever considered that? It's like it's almost like we're holding a. I don't know. It's almost like we're holding a black hole in our hands. That sounds kind of weird. 
But let me explain. Like if you, um, you know, secular folks talk about the, the Big Bang, right? All of the matter in the universe being condensed down into a single point, you know, something denser even than a black hole, and then it just explodes, right? That's the Big Bang, and that's where everything comes from. All right, that's the source of all existence and all life in the universe. Can you imagine holding that in your hand? I mean, you'd be destroyed instantly. But imagine, they, they say at one point it was all that small. Now, we know where the universe took it. It took its actual existence. The universe comes to be not through a gigantic explosion, but through the Word of God. And we can hold the Word of God in our hands. It's a wonder our hands don't melt and don't fall off. It's a wonder we're not destroyed when we look at this book. Because this is the power that created everything. Which is why, and again, that's why we say it is so necessary, so worthwhile, so valuable. Because the same word that created everything we find present in this book. In the beginning, and just as we read in Hebrews, God created the world through his Son. That's what the Hebrew writer says. It's not explicit and apparent in Genesis 1, but it's something that's developed over the course of Scripture. That this creative act, God said, let there be light and there was light, that this takes place through his Son. That is what the Hebrew writer says, that in these latter days, he has spoken to us through his Son, by whom he has created everything. We get his exact words. Yeah, through whom also he created the world. In this... Right, the Hebrew writer is presenting the Word of God and presenting creation pretty much in the same way that John did at the beginning of his Gospel. Right? We, we camped out on this for a while because it is impossible to exhaust the significance of John's introduction to his Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, John says. Mirroring Genesis 1.1, in the beginning... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Christ, through whom God speaks to us today, is the Word that John identifies here in John 1.1. He is the Word through whom God created the whole world in the beginning. Jesus himself is the speech that created the universe. And we learn from the Gospel that the Word which in the beginning had the power to create life from nothing, we learn that it now has the power through Christ to create new life, even life from the dead. All right, that's, that's, the central, that's the central teaching of the Gospels. Not just John's Gospel, but all the Gospels. All right, that's what Paul delivers over as of first importance in 1 Corinthians 15. That Christ has come back from the dead. That He has conquered death. That this Word, who is Jesus Christ, brings life even to the dead. So that when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what we profess. 
that the word of Christ is a source of life for all who believe. And so hearing the word is essential. Again, it's not just getting the rule book. It's not just getting the owner's manual, as it were. Again, this is kind of a... You could think of this as an owner's manual to the universe. But more than that, it is a source of life. And that is why hearing is so important, and that is why Paul ascribes such great power to hearing. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Now there's a lot that we could say about hearing. All right, whenever you, whenever you look for you know, hearing in the scriptures, whenever you look for you know, Shema, the, the Hebrew word for hearing, it's all over the place. But we're going to limit ourselves to just one more consideration. So to finish up today, I want us to consider what the scriptures mean when they say hear. Right, because in English, we understand right, that there is a world of difference between hearing and hearing. Right? Or the difference between hearing and listening. Right, we understand there is a world of difference between hearing and listening. Uh, we say pretty commonly uh, that, well, I mean, I, I say this of my kids all the time. It seems like it goes in one ear and out the other. They hear, but they do not listen. This is much easier to hear than it is to listen, right? We, we, all, uh, we all relate to that. It's way easier for sounds to enter my ears than it is for me to actually pay them any attention. In the scriptures, uh, the words that are used for hearing typically carry both senses to them. right? Not only to hear, but also to listen. So like the Hebrew word shema, which a lot of times in our Bibles gets translated to hear. It means both to hear and to listen. It also means to obey. You see that same word Shema used all over the Old Testament in all of those ways. And anytime that we read the word hear in the law or in the prophets, we should think of it in terms of listen and obey, because that's what it means to hear in the Old Testament. All right, our English translations usually pick up on this. They usually do a good job of this. So, for example, in our auditorium class recently, uh, we've been through Numbers chapter 14. I want us to consider a complaint that God levies against Israel in Numbers chapter 14. It's a pretty distinctive complaint. Numbers chapter 14, we'll start in verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. So he's speaking to Moses, who's just interceded for Israel. But truly, as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers, and none of those who despised me shall see it. But notice the way he characterizes Israel here. They've seen my glory, they saw my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet, he says, they have put me to the test these ten times and have not heard my voice. They did not shema, the Lord says. All right, our ESV rightly translates it, obeyed. They have not obeyed my voice at the end of verse 22. But it's that word here. They've not heard my voice, the Lord says. Now, have they heard the Lord? Well, yeah, they've heard the Lord. In the sense that we usually use the word here. You remember all the way back in Exodus, they're at Mount Sinai, and the Lord declares the commandments to them. 
They all hear the voice of the Lord and they all tremble. They can't bear to hear the Lord's voice anymore. And so they beg Moses to intercede for them. Go up on the mountain and receive the word of the Lord so that we don't hear his voice anymore and die. They heard him, but they didn't hear him. And the Lord says, they've put me to the test these ten times and have not heard my voice. Because if you will not do as the Lord has commanded, then you have not truly heard him. This is, by the way, the chief contention against the Jews in the first century who wouldn't believe in Christ. It's the broader message of Romans chapter 10. I want us to finish by considering this in Romans 10, this, this sense in which hearing is used. If we go back to Romans 10, you know, we, like we said, we normally quote out of Romans 10, 17 and kind of lift it out of its context. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I want us to pick up the broader context here in Romans chapter 10. We'll start in verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, that is for the sons of Israel, is that they may be saved. In other words, they're not, as of Paul's writing. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. In other words, they didn't hear. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And who is the word but Christ? They did not hear the word. That's the complaint. That's the context in Romans chapter 10. All right, we, we kind of pick up the positive out of the chapter. The positive command is, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But the reason Paul says it is because Israel has not heard he says, it's my prayer to God that they may be saved. And even just right around verse 17, well, let's, let's pick up some context right around there. We'll start in verse 17 and keep reading. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? For Moses says, I will make you jealous of a nation, of, uh, sorry, of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. And so in the midst of this, as, as the context for this, we learn that all faith comes through hearing, but not all hearing leads to faith. Paul says, have they not heard? Indeed, they have. And Paul says, already by his time, by the time that Christ had come to them, their voice has gone out to all the earth. He's quoting from the prophets here. Their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Israel has heard, Paul says. And not just Israel, but everyone else has heard too. For Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. And remember, in the Old Testament, the nations are the Gentiles. Isaiah is so bold as to say, I've been found by those who did not seek me. That is, the Gentiles. I've shown myself to those who did not ask for me. That is, the Gentiles. They've heard and they listened, Paul says. But of Israel, he says, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. They've heard, 
but they refused to listen. And so it is a great blessing to receive the word of the Lord, as we've seen, but it is absolutely meaningless if you are not going to listen to it. You can read this word from cover to cover. You can hold the power that created the universe in your hands and you can read every word of it and it can be completely useless to you. Just ask Israel. They had the word living among them. He came to his own people, John tells us, and his own people rejected him. We must heed the warning of Israel. Because it's not just something that God warns us about in the Old Testament. It's something that the inspired writers were careful to warn us about in the New Testament as well. Now turn to James chapter 1. And James warns us, beginning in chapter 1, verse 22, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Right? Remember, if you're, if you're not obeying the word, you've not really heard it. You did not hear my voice, the Lord says. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So the matter is memory, keeping the word. Right? Are you going to be like a guy who looks at himself in the mirror and as soon as he looks away doesn't have any sort of clear conception of what he actually looks like? Or are you going to be the sort who looks into the law and perseveres, that is, who keeps it? This is why in the Scriptures there is such a premium on memory, remembrance. We see the apostles saying this all the time. We see Jude saying it. I'm bringing these things to your remembrance, they say. But this is something that's, that has its roots in the law. Right? We all remember... Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. All right, this passage, by the way, we typically call the Shema. It's that same word, hear, listen. Right? It's the opening word of this commandment. Shema, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall walk, sorry, and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your head and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The word is to be ever before us. This act of hearing is something that does not cease. All right, you know, sometimes we look at the five steps as like a, a, a process, a linear path that we follow. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. And if we're not careful, we'll treat it like it's just a linear process where whenever you, you know, you start at point A and you get to point G or wherever, and whenever you reach point G, you've gone past point A. You don't, you don't have to go back there. But that's not the way the scriptures present it. That's not the way they present the word. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Heart. 
You shall teach them to your children. You'll talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. In other words, in all of your doings. Right? The ancient world was kind of a boring place. He's just described pretty much everything that people did in the ancient world. Sleep and walk around. In all of that, he says, the Word is with you. You're talking of the Word. You're talking with your kids about it. You are stamping it on your forehead. That's how, that's how persistent it is to be with you. Right? You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And that's pretty evocative, too, because what do we normally associate with being put on the doorpost? But the blood of the Passover lamb is in that same place. You shall write the words of the commandment on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So we who have obeyed the gospel and been baptized into Jesus Christ must still constantly have the word before us. This process of hearing never ends. The word must ever be before us. Because if it's not in front of us, if we forget it, well, Deuteronomy talks about that as well. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery." It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by His name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God is in your midst as a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and He destroy you from off the face of the earth. All right, that escalates very quickly in the text, doesn't it? It starts with them not remembering properly. It starts with them entering into the wealth of the Lord's promise and getting distracted and forgetting. And that quickly goes to following after other gods and being destroyed in the Lord's wrath. And that is precisely the warning for us that we must constantly keep the word before us because the Lord blesses us. The Lord sets all kinds of good things before us. And the adversary is constantly inviting us to dwell on those good things and make them our God. To make TV our God. To make the bank account our God. To make our cars our God. To make politics our God. All of these things that creep in and occupy our minds, these other things that we want to stamp on our foreheads and write on our doorposts instead of the word of the Lord. And after we follow after those other gods, the Lord says that all that is left for us is his wrath. So we invite you today to hear the word of the Lord. Obey it, listen to it, and keep it before you always. Keith has selected number 507, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Let the word of the Lord have its power in you, the power that created the whole universe. Imagine what it can do in you. If you need to respond to the gospel, we invite you to do that today. If you need to repent, we invite you to do that today. Whatever your need is, we invite you to make it known by coming forward as together we stand and sing.